I will be recording this session as well, like I was uh, last time, for those of you who attended. The idea is I'm putting them up on YouTube on our Radio Parts uh, uh, channel, so you can subscribe to it and watch videos like this one. This one, I think, is going to be uh, probably a little bit dense, and because of the information that's on the screen, it's a bit hard to do it on this kind of camera as well, so there'll probably be multiple ones going up there with more detail on it. Alright, to start properly, my name is Ben Marshall, I am from Radio Parts, and I will be your trainer for today. This is the second of our CCTV training sessions. I did one two weeks ago that is up on the YouTube page, you can uh, view it anytime you want to, refer back to it, and we looked at lenses and cameras themselves last time. There's a lot of technical stuff, this time I'm trying to make it a little bit more hands-on, a little less technology, and we'll see how we go. Um, actually, no, lots of technology, but more hands-on stuff. So, slides. You've only got five on the sheet in front of you, and one of them is the intro slides, so you're getting off very lightly today. Um, I'm going to look at our old analog DVR, which I've got in front of us. I'll look at the new 960 horizontal uh, DVR, which is 700 lines. I'll also look at HDSDI, and try to fit in a bit of IP stuff at the end. I've got an NVR and a NAS drive there. Um, and my thanks to Alloys for those and for the IP cameras, they managed to sort that out very, very quickly for me when it was needed. So, um, yeah, I've got some toys. Go on, Graham. Um, something here referred to as TVL, TV lines. TV lines. What is that? It's, you look at the resolution of a still image, say 1024 by 768. Um, that's 768 TV lines, so it's lines of resolution across the screen. So it's the equivalent of 625 for PAL, is that right? Uh, that same concept? 576 for PAL for D1. I'll actually have that on the slide in a second too. But yeah, um, yeah, those TV lines refer to those uh, lines of horizontal resolution on a screen anyway. Um, yeah, vertical columns versus horizontal lines, anyway, one of those things. Um, Cool. All right, let's start. I'm going to do the same slide as I did last week with one little update on it. I wanted to look at the very basics of the details again for those of you who weren't here. For those of you who were, you already know this stuff. Um, but the basics are analog, HDSDI, and IP are the three sort of competing and complementary technologies of CCTV. Uh, analog recorders and analog DVRs are fantastic at lower resolutions. They're really economical. They're easy to run with RG59 and a bit of power cable. And they're suitable for a whole range of homes and you know small businesses and things like that. But when you get to the really high-end jobs and a lot of the really intricate features that you absolutely have to have, that's when the analog systems start to run out of steam. Uh, if you need the high resolutions, you need to start looking at things like HDSDI to do it. Although there are some cameras and some systems that can do up to a thousand TV lines. I mean that's almost 1080p quality. But in an analog sense. Looks from the ones I've seen, it looks like they sacrifice image quality for actual number of pixels on the screen. I'd rather have higher quality and less pixels, you'll get a better result in the end. It's a bit like um, your digital cameras. Just because it's got 48 megapixels doesn't mean you're going to have a fantastic image once you get out of it. And some of the highest, best professional end cameras on the market don't have the most megapixels. So. Um, HDSDI is a technology that refer, it uses the same sort of cabling as the old systems, RG59 plus power. Um, easy to upgrade over existing networks if the quality, if the cabling is there. And you get 1080p digital images over the same coax that you used before. Using decent quality coax, RG59 or RG6 is essential. Um, using cheaper and lighter grade stuff that you may have got in the kit with a product or pre-made leads is not so good for HDSDI. Again, I did all this last week, this is just a recap. There are more limited options in cameras and recorders though because not that many people do HDSDI, but as I'll show you in a, uh, in a few minutes, the quality is really, really good. I think you'll like it. And the last one I want to talk about is IP, which has got high resolutions typically. 720 to 1080p are pretty normal for that. The cameras themselves can be 3 megapixels, 5 megapixels, 10 or more megapixels worth of still images and still provide those 1080p streaming images of video as well. 
Um, and there are some unique camera options like hemispherics that, and fish eyes that can be split up into multiple camera views in the one camera. Stuff that analog systems can't do at this stage anyway. They run over data networks, so that's standard Cat5 or Cat6, and because of the type of cabling it is and the type of network it is, that communication can be bi-directional as well, which it isn't for the other ones. So if you want PTZ and an analog camera, you've got to run some extra cable. With digital ones, I'll show you a bit later, it's possible to do it just with that one Cat5 or Cat6. So, easy to work with, and, well, no, it's easy to install. Problems can come when it's the amount of data that's being streamed around a network. You need decent network hardware and you need decent NVRs and NAS drives to record this information that have the brain power to be able to code and decode it as necessary. But I will go into that in more detail. So, something I've sort of rushed through last week and didn't really explain properly, I thought might be useful to go over again. These are some of the standard camera recording resolutions starting with SIF, which is an old and mostly outdated format now, although it's good for streaming because it's got lower bandwidths, you can shoot it out over your 3G or 4G without killing your data. Uh, it, believe it or not, that little Canon camera in the front there is not that much better than that. I think it's about 350 TV lines worth of resolution, but it has some cool tricks up its sleeve, so I'll show you those later. D1 is the standard for our current generation of uh, DVRs. That's 576 lines worth of recording, in PAL, that is. And the quality is good. It's great for an analog system. It's great for the average home and small business. If you choose your cameras properly, you can make those things, that 576 lines, dance for you. It's fantastic. However, if you need the higher resolution, we will have a 960H or a 960 by 700 line recorder coming out in the next few months. There's no official date for it yet. They, I don't even think they've been ordered from overseas, but we've got some samples and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute as well. The benefit of that at this stage is our cameras are 700 lines, most of them, so we'll now have a DVR that can record at the native resolution of the cameras themselves, getting the best quality out of it. And it is quite striking. Um, that I compared with HD 720p resolution as well as 1080p resolution out on the edge. Um, you can see the amount of extra data that's involved in these ones and the amount of extra pixels that you get means there's a lot more information you can get out of your video. And again, see last week's video for more, or last time's video for more information on those. Does that all make sense? Everybody's clear about the differences? Yeah? Beautiful. I made them all pretty colours so it was nice and easy <laughs> to understand. Um, and there's no Mike's head this week. You'll, you know, Mike will be glad to know. Um, I also made a blue last week, um, and I have to apologise to Joe for this one because it was uh, in response to one of your questions that I made this mistake. I was talking about the amount of file size it was going to take for better resolutions worth of recording, and Douglas pointed out to me he got it right at the time, and I was not thinking properly. But because of the encoding, because of the H.264 packaging that you put onto the video stream, just because you've got more image on the screen doesn't mean it's going to go linearly up in the amount of extra data and bitrate it actually needs. I sat down and did the maths on it to make sense. So this is a rough guide based on one camera recording 24 hours a day, every day for two weeks, using 25 frames per second, H.264 encoding with decent quality or better quality depending on which you know, recorder you're using. At D1 resolution, you've got around about 15 gigabytes per day or 215 over the space of two weeks. That's roughly what ours are currently doing. So you put a one terabyte drive in on a four camera system, that'll get you two weeks without any trouble. Put a two terabyte one in, you should get a month without too much drama. At 720p, which is the closest I could find to our 700 line recorders, you can see that data goes up dramatically to the point where you get nearly 550 gigabytes for a two week recording on one <coughs> camera. So if you had two of these, two cameras on one of those DVRs with a one terabyte drive, it'd tick over in less than two weeks. So you need to start looking at two terabytes as a minimum, even just for a couple of cameras. And for more than that, you probably need to get a couple of drives, a couple of two terabyte ones, or a three terabyte or four terabyte drive just to make sure you've got enough recording to be able to handle it, okay? Um, and the last one is the 1080p recording. At H.264, those resolutions, 
uh, <coughs> nearly 90 gigabytes a day or 1.2 terabytes for one camera over the space of two weeks. Very rough, but you can see that a two terabyte drive just gets you enough information for this thing for two weeks. That's one camera on its own. Um, yeah, you need big hard drives to deal with most of the IP camera systems. Uh, two things to mention here. Number one in hard drives, Western Digital's just brought out a new range of hard drives called their Purple series. They've had blues and greens and blacks and reds and other stuff in the past. Well, Purple is specifically designed for security and CCTV systems. They've got 24-7 reliability, they've got uh, better caching so they can handle the increased data speeds and bit rates of IP camera systems and ones that shoot as much data as you possibly can at it. So they're the, the hard drives of choice if you, can, uh, yeah, if you can justify it in your system. If you need it there, we will have those. I've got John on call looking for those ones. I'm sure we'll have them very soon. And they do four terabyte drives and so on. Saw them at a, an event last week and I was unlucky enough not to win a four terabyte drive for turning up to it, which is a bit of a shame. But this is the way it goes. Um, my last point on this is I've used this term H.264 a lot and I haven't actually talked about what it is. So, very quickly, H.264 is a way of packaging video recording. It's an encoding format. Um, it's the thing that you use when you're watching a Blu-ray disc most of the time. It's what you're watching when you stream YouTube or Vimeo or most of the iTunes store videos are mostly streamed that way. It's a fantastic streaming format and it was designed for movies and for motion pictures, that sort of thing. Um, what it does is it compresses the video really, really well. So when you do a, uh, when you're streaming a movie or when you're playing a movie on a big screen, it needs less of a data pipe to get all the stuff there. So it's efficient when it comes to that. And on a movie on a big screen, the way it compresses the image is by looking at the bits that are shifting and it compresses those more than the bits that are stationary. So the backgrounds look clearer, but that guy running in front of you, well, you're not expecting him to stand out in clear, perfect detail that way. So they compress that part, it means they save a lot of data, a lot of bit rate by doing it. Um, the problem with that is when you turn it into a CCTV field, you press pause on the CCTV recording and you're sort of mid-frame or you're midway between it, the edges of the thing get fuzzy or the detail is lost, the focus is slightly lost because it doesn't have that information there to work with. It's great for streaming, it's great for networks, it's great for low bandwidth, but maybe not always the best choice for recordings. Um, it is fairly intensive on the cameras and on the decoders in the NVRs as well because they need to do a lot of heavy lifting to be able to turn that stream into a usable format to, into the hard drive to be able to push it out the other side and so on and so on. So getting better DVRs and NVRs with brain power to handle it is important. Um, some cameras that don't use that are actually dumber, slightly cheaper and can give you an equivalent or better image quality as well. It depends on your application. Um, the other option as far as IP cameras go is Motion JPEG normally, which is MJPEG. It's an unlicensed standard and it's based around individual frames. So if you lose a frame in a sequence, it's not a problem. It's, you know, it just keeps on going and does what it does. And because it's recording sort of frame by frame, as it were, it's not losing any of the quality. The problem with that is if you don't lose the quality, you don't have any compression, which means the bit rates are much, much higher, which means a lot higher you know, requirements on the network pipes to be able to get it there. And it's also a lot larger on a hard drive. Um, I, look, I did the calculation very roughly last night. It's you know, two to four times is sort of an average for it. So that 1.2 terabyte drive that was needed for the two weeks of one camera 1080p becomes a two and a half terabyte drive or more just for the same one camera over that time. But if it's a really critical area, we have to see that footage. I mean, we're looking at two weeks worth of recording. Chances are if you've got a high-end jewellery store or a fuel station or, you know, the local bottle it wants to know about that guy that came in 15 minutes ago, not that guy that came in a month, you know, a week ago and lost, you know, they lost that carton of beer or whatever it was. So it is a good recording standard for CCTV, but it's not specifically designed for that. So there's still some shortcomings when it comes to streaming them over networks. The other one that I haven't put up here is one that Mobotics developed specifically for CCTV and it's kind of a hybrid of the two. 
it takes the image quality from this one and the static or the frame by frame nature of it, but manages still to compress the moving parts of the image in, well, it compresses everything else but the moving parts of the image in such a way that you use a lot less data and you still get the same image quality as before. There are some great videos and stills online of in the middle of video playback, a bird in flight with its full feathers outstretched and all the detail that's in them. And this bird is in front of the camera for less than half a second as it flies past. Some amazing stuff that they can do with their formats. So, yeah, Mobotics developed us specifically for that. It also does most of the heavy lifting in the camera. So the DVRs, oh sorry, the NVRs in this case are almost not necessary. You can plug them straight into a NAS drive and just record the footage straight from the unit. It can do the motion detection, it can analyse movements, it can do all these other things without needing that NVR to really do the heavy lifting at the other end. So, in one sense the cameras are more expensive, but because they're doing a lot of the jobs of other components in the system, they're also theoretically a more efficient way of doing it. And if you put a NAS drive or hard drive storage up somewhere near the camera local, have a single network cable back down into your main network, the only time that that data is being streamed over the network is when you want it to be. So you're not having that continuous stream going backwards and forwards along with everything else to go to the NVR, to the hard drives, to the whatever. It's just all happening up here. It means that if you call for information, you send a request up to the cable, to the camera, it does the decoding, does everything else it needs to do, pushes the information down and you get that request at the other end. So it's a sort of a decentralized way of looking at it. Um, that's the best I can describe it. There are plenty of people who know it better than I do and I encourage you to have a look online. There are some really good videos about how all that system works and how exactly the MXPEG format and codec works as well. Just then, you know, motion detect obviously, you know, you, you get a lot, a lot more hours out of Definitely. the analog systems. I'm just thinking with motion detect on IP systems, is that probably easier on the networks, is it? It can be. Um, the problem is that it, it, when you're setting motion detect in an NVR, it's set in the NVR itself. So you've still got all that data coming down to the NVR, and then the NVR says, well, I don't care. <laughs> it's not really saying, I want you to trigger it's now, it's got a monitor. Drive. It really is in an NVR. Um, however, a lot of these cameras have got the smarts in it, and you can log into the camera itself and theoretically set up the motion detection in the camera so that it doesn't send anything down until it knows that you know something has happened that it wants to look after. So the Mobotics again does that. The Actis, the Axis, they all have some capability depending on which camera they are. Abby? Um, you know how our DVRs have that sort of five second interval when the motion yep. triggers? Yep. If it's set in the camera, would you close that feature? Yeah. Uh, it depends on the camera. Yeah. So it, uh, delay, or sorry, not delay, what's the other word for it? Um, buffering the recording or pre triggering the recording for motion detection. It's built into some of the cameras themselves, even in an analog sense. In IP, it's built into a lot of them, not necessarily all, but look for it on the list of features and it might be able to do that for you. Um, the NVRs have certainly got that in, and I'll show you that in a minute as well. Cool, that's all the slides I wanted to go through. So, have you got any questions about the stuff that's in front of you right now? Cool. Alright, I need to move on then because we've got a lot I still want to cover. So, let me jump across, actually, let's do it this way. This is our analog DVR with a 700 line Dome 30 Pro camera on it. Dome 30 Pro camera on D1 resolution and that's what we're looking at. Okay. It's decent enough quality, I can definitely tell who you all are. I can tell when Darren picks his nose up in the back row, for example. You know? <laughs> and if, uh, if uh, Louis happened to put a rude sign up behind Kiyu's head, we could see that as well. So it's, it's easy enough in this range to see what it does, and it does it well. Um, the other thing I wanted to show off to you when I've got the analog system up is on the cable there's a little control button, a little, um, little controller that's on there. And remember last week I made a big fuss about WDR? wide dynamic range. This is what it does to an image. So we go to mid-high, we go actually to mid-high will do, and then I take the uh, same wrong camera, let's try this one, and there's that same image. You can see in the lights above, you can see details, I mean I was looking at it before, you see the details in the ceiling tiles, but you can also see I think that might be an artifact there, but there's some reflections around the edges of them like you actually see up on the ceiling itself. 
So it does make a big difference having WDR in the camera. Imagine this outside where you've got a lot of strong light from headlights, from sunlight, from reflected light or spotlights, whatever else is going on. Very, very useful. Um, get out of this. I'll show you one other one which I rather like because it's kind of nifty. And that's HLC. Turn this on. You can see what it's doing for the brightest parts of the image. So we're like wearing sunglasses. Yeah. So you can see over above Kingo's head there are the LED array on the wall, and that's sort of blanked out completely. From here, it's quite a blinding thing to look directly at, but on here, it's better. So it's a way of sort of dimming down some of those biggest lights that are on there to make it better for you and better for the image quality. Um, so I'm just going to do a very very rough look at this DVR. Most of you have used these before, so I don't want to go through a lot of detail on here. Just turn this off. Out. And you can see this one's actually got motion detection in the camera itself. Being an analog system, there's not really an easy way for it to tell the DVR that it's actually done the motion detection thing. Uh, okay, let's get out of that. So those of you who have used these ones before are pretty familiar with how this works. Um, unfortunately, because of the way I've got this set up through the switch and the rest of it, I didn't. it's chopping some of the parts of the image off, so I have to be a bit careful what screens and things I go to, otherwise I can't get out of them. Um, but I wanted to show you a couple of quick things that people don't always know. When it comes to searching, you can see it's missing half the bottom of the screen, and the new ones have actually, uh, the new software that's on our new, uh, on our analog DVRs has actually got colour bars to show you when the recordings are. This is an older one off the show floor, so it doesn't have the, those same colour bars on it. The principle is the same, you just don't get the same list and things on the side. If I just do a basic search on channel 1, because that's all I've got connected. Hang on, let's do that. I get a whole list of recordings, and I was playing around with one earlier, I think it's this one. See in our recording, this is on motion detection, and oh look, there's Damien coming in at the bottom of the screen there. This is people turning up for the first setting, and this is a motion detection recording I've just picked out by random. If I now choose that recording, tick it here, and then use that little bot, the little yellow icon, it brings up a backup screen. If I've got a USB drive in there, I can dump this file onto it. If I tick this box here, it turns into a standard AVI format rather than the proprietary one that comes in it. Um, useful if you want to take it everywhere. Um, it's not quite as secure, so it's easier to copy and do other things with them. You know, but it's there if you need to. It tells you what size it is, how much you need on the disk, and so on. When you want to back it up, all you do is click start and dumps it onto a USB stick for you. It's very simple. And I'm right clicking to get out of that because that's all I wanted to do. In configuration, there's a couple of things. Pack duration. Pack duration is the size of the recordings. If you're doing timer recording, 24 hours a day, by default it's set to 60. That means if something happens now at 41 minutes past the hour, you can't pick up what that recording was until it's finished 19 minutes in 19 minutes time. By which point the guy that's stolen the bottle of bourbon off the front counter has run out and down the street into his car and probably drunk half of the thing before he got home. So, Having a shorter pack duration means more files to go through and look at, but it also means that you're more likely to pick up the information when it's critical, when it's needed. For example, it's 42 minutes past the hour. With 15 minute pack duration, the next one of those should be coming up in about three minutes time, so you've got a better chance of catching the guy. You can set that even shorter, but you end up with a massive list of files that you need to go through if something happens. How are the files named? Are they, are they given the signature? Just by time. By, by time that they are, and whether it's a motion detection or, well, actually, in this sense, they're just timer recording. So it'll be 8.45, 9am, 9.15, 9.30, and so on. Um, in the recording settings, most of you have done this, but I want to go through it very briefly. Uh, the colour bars tell you whether it's timer recording or motion detection or alarm recording. To set them, just go in and choose it. Choose the days that you want it to apply to. And look, now I've got three green bars along with all my yellow ones. I go to another channel and I'll look through all motion detection. So I can go into copy, copy, well, select all, and it's based on this one. So if I go back to my camera one, they're all back to motion detection. It's that fast to do it, really easy. If you want to set up multiple periods in a day, you've got six to play with there as well, so you can have, 
you know, midnight through to 8 a.m. motion detection while it's after hours, 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. You can have timer recording so that it goes off the whole time that you're watching your staff. And 6 p.m. through till midnight, you've got motion detection again at the end of the day. So it's a good way of saving a bit of hard drive space overnight and keeping the critical stuff during the day. Questions? Yes. Sorry, can you select alarm on all of them as well as... Yes, you can. Um, alarms are triggered recordings. They've got input channels on here. So if you trigger it with a gate being open or an ultrasonic sensor for the glass being broken or something like that, you could do that to trigger it as well. Most people I mean, don't as, use it. As well as your regular... Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can have both of them running at the same time. You actually have regular recording, alarm recording and time uh, motion detection all simultaneously if you wanted massive overkill, but yes, it's there. Um, yes, um, the last one was network settings on here. I don't want to go into it in detail because it's going to take too long. I've set this thing up to get its IP address automatically from my little router that I've got here. It makes it easier for me to set up and faster. At home, you probably don't want to do this because if something else goes onto your network and plugs in and wants the same IP address, we don't know whether it's going to get it or whether it's going to knock yours out and to somewhere else that it needs to go and then you don't know whether your settings are right on your app or when you're trying to log in via Internet Explorer or anything <coughs> else. So important to note, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. I generally prefer to have them with their own IP addresses. Your gateway address in there is obviously your modem or your, your main router's address, in this case 192.168.0.1. Um, in the advanced settings, you've got the dynamic DNS, so you can choose no IP like our remote access techs do. You sign up for an account on their website and they give you a domain name, which might be bensdvr.noip.com. Put that in with your username and password, and that means that no matter what happens to your home IP address or your business IP address, it'll just keep updating and going to the new one. You put your Ben's DVR address into your apps, into Google, well not into Google, into your address bar in Internet Explorer and it will keep going to your DVR. Uh, downside for that is if it ever loses sync with the no IP guys, you might have to go in and reset it and do it again, but there it is. How will you know when you've lost, uh, by trying to access by it? By trying to access it and it fails, then you've lost sync for some reason. You don't get a notification? No. no. Um, yeah, it might actually be possible, but I have to think my way through about how to do that. I'll do that another time when I'm not <laughs> thinking this. Um, the last one on here is multicast. This is where your settings for your port forwarding for your remote access come in. Um, your external IP address, your static IP address if you've got it, and the port that you're using to do it. Um, TCP port and UDP port and so on for it. There's also a universal plug and play port mapping which can work depending on the router as well but that's a yeah that's not always the best solution to my recommendation for anybody who sees all this stuff and hears it as complete gibberish we've got a remote access service for all of our DVRs um, you can buy the service uh, as a card or as a, a specific service itself got technicians who log in remotely to your computer, set your settings for your DVR, they set you up with a no IP address if you haven't got a static one. They do all of this for I think about $40 retail. So it's incredibly economical way to do it. I don't know any computer techs here in Australia that do it at that sort of price. So if you get the chance, it's well worth doing. And you know, even if you are good with networking, the first few times you do a DVR, it might take you longer than you think it's going to, to do this stuff. Get them in for one or two goes, learn what they're doing, understand what they're doing for it all, and it might make you more efficient at doing it in future. And if you end up in trouble, you can always use their help to uh, get you out of trouble as well. Very, yeah, very useful. Good point, ben, because when they set it up, when they set it up at my house and they're on the phone, and you, but you're watching what they're doing on the computer, and normally they'll actually tell you what they're doing, so they'll step you through it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, if you're doing multiple jobs, then you get them to do the first time of watch. Yeah, and ask questions as well. They're incredibly patient, so I, you know, I think you, know, um, you could take a fair amount of uh, questions and bugging them before they start getting annoyed with you. So really, really good. We chose them for a reason. They're worth it. Um, okay, so that's the networking on this one. I don't want to go through the rest of this because you know most of it already. Only bit that might come up is motion detection in here. In the alarm settings, you can set what areas you want to set for recording, uh, for triggering motion detection or not. Um, yeah, pretty simple to work with.
and you can also set what it does and what it, where it sends information to and so on and so on from there. Alright, so that's the analog, the existing analog DVR. Let's switch over to, thankfully it works, the new 960 line DVR. This is still an analog DVR but it records at 700 lines or 960 horizontal columns or whatever you want to put it. So, I've got, which one am I looking at? The IN15 Pro, it should be this one, yes it is. Got the IN15 Pro on it, which is another 700 line camera. You remember what this one, the 700 line before looked like on the D1? It was fine, it's decent. Well, how about this instead? There's a lot more detail in the image. And a lot more colour saturation too. True. Although that's part of the settings, I haven't really done anything to set this up properly, but uh, yes. It makes a huge difference. There's still the same seven. Well, there's still a 700 line sensor that's in there, but because we've now got the resolution to cope with it better, the image quality is better. There's, I think about 30% more pixels worth of data, so you can see that much more detail in people's faces and number plates or whatever else it is that you're trying to capture. And that's with an analog DVR. That's using analog cabling, analog power supplies, and so on. So it will be very, very, very cool when they arrive. The setup is different though. Um, if I do a quick log in here, you can see the menu already looks different. And going into the settings is a different beast. What I might do though, is I'll switch it over to the HD-STI one because it has the same setup, the same sort of screens. But it's a big shining example of what is possible with 1080p over RG59 cabling as well. So this, is a 1080p camera. It is the full high def dome. It's streaming an HD SDI resolution and I can't quite get the angle right there. There we go. The amount of detail difference between the two is again gigantic. The, you know, the level of detail to see the highlights in people's hair and so on at these sort of ranges is fantastic. <laughs> well, it's, there's still highlights. There's still highlights. <laughs> it's a bit of reflection. <laughs> it's a, that's a 1080p camera and an HD SDI DVR. I mean, it, yeah, even just into things like the speakers up on the wall. Yeah, really, really impressive stuff. So, HD SDI is a great technology, particularly if you're upgrading from something uh, that was an analog system with decent cables. So, Does it, can you use balance? Put in Cat5 and use uh, balance and adapters on each end? Yes, you can. However, um, I th don't think we've got them in stock yet. I know that our buyers are buying them from overseas right now. Oh, okay. They are a lot more expensive than their analog brethren. Oh. Um, they have to do a lot more, there's a lot more brain power involved in taking a 1080p digital signal and then encoding it over the Cat5 to do it. So oh. I can't remember. I know our buyer did tell me roughly what they were going to be, but it's probably somewhere in the $150 plus for a kit of these things. So if you have to do it, it's possible. Around, we, yeah. we got two balance. There's a couple, yeah. You guys, you guys were using some balance. Um, mm. Yeah. So we've got um, HDMI yeah. type, type balance, but yeah, a lot more coming in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're getting them because we need them. And if the need is there, we'll get more of them and hopefully they get cheaper if we buy them in bigger quantities. But the technology that's in them is pretty smart. It costs a bit of money, unfortunately. So, um, All right, so let's just jump into this. This is the basic setup the first time you look at it. Choose your output resolution, your formatting and so on. Um, you can set your IP addresses here to start off with. And okay, whatever. Let's just jump straight into the playback for it. And I made the same mistake I made last time, I think. No, this will be okay. Um, the idea is that you can select which camera. The red days come up and tell you which days have got motion detection. And if you can see the bottom of the screen, there'd be another color bar there and you can choose exactly what section you want to watch. Click on it and it appears up on the screen. You can <coughs> take still images out of it. You can pick the information as a file and download it or back it up and do other things like that from there as well. Very, very similar to how the analog DVRs work. And in fact, this is the menu structure and the same sort of screen that you will have on the 960 recorders when they arrive as well. So it should be unified, make it very, very easy whether you're jumping from HD-SDI to analog to HD-SDI to whatever. 
thankfully I can actually get out of this one by right clicking. If I go into one of the recording settings and start messing around, then the only button I can choose sits somewhere <coughs> up here and I can't see it. So made that mistake the first time around, I'm not going to do that this time. Um, backing up is pretty simple. You can choose it in whatever size chunks you want. So you don't have to get the 15 minute file that you did on the previous one or the motion detection for those 20 seconds. You can choose to go for an hour, 15 minutes, 17 and a half minutes, or 3 minutes and 43 seconds if that's what you want to do with it. MP4, AVI, USB stick, it's the same sort of thing as the other one. It's quite easy to work through and do. That's why I'm jumping through it fast. Um, I think you'll agree that the screens are a lot friendlier on this one. They're easy to see what's going on as well. Going into the basic settings for it, you've got all the things that you expect. You can stream it at 720p if you've got lower resolution cameras. I would suggest not, but there it is. Um, record, replace, you know, overwrite old files, that sort of stuff. Uh, pan, tilt and zoom is obviously built into the thing as well. Channel settings, you can put your name onto the channels. You can show the name and date on each of those. You can set where it is. And there are settings in here to adjust what the cameras uh, see in terms of brightness, contrast, saturation and hue as well. So if you get those oversaturated images like you were looking at before, there's ways of adjusting that to, to get something better out of it. Um, video parameters, yeah, the types of stream and what resolution you're running it in. All fairly simple and I can't imagine many people are going to go want a lower frame rate than 25 to 30. But if you have problems with stability or with dropouts and other things like that, lowering your frame rate may give you less of those issues. Schedule recording. This is actually one of my favourite bits. The recording settings are in here. I've just got all day recording for motion at the moment. So we've got yellow, yellow everywhere, all days of the week for this camera. If I go over to one of the other ones, oh look, they've set it for all of them exactly the same. But I don't want all day recording. I want to do bits and pieces. So I can do Let's say motion detection until 6 a.m. There we go. I want to do schedule recording from about 6 a.m. through to, I don't know, 8 o'clock at night. I do that. Now I've got a that section. But I also want to do alarm recordings there. So that's in the background there, and I can put a bit over there for it. Do motion alarm over that section there, and so on and so on. It's like paint by numbers on the screen. So a really easy visual way to see exactly what you're doing with it. And if you've made a mess of it, I'll just click on all day recording and it goes back to a nice solid color again. So, very nice, very easy. Motion detection, I'm not clicking on that. That's what killed me last time. Um, it brings up a full screen where you can select what sections of the screen you want to motion detect or not, and I couldn't close the window down. So, make sure the resolution settings are correct for your device and for your screen before you play with it, unlike what I did. You can set that, you can set the sensitivity, and yeah, you can set a, an individual section for the arming on the motion detection as well. Not a lot of not a lot of reasons why you want to do that separate from the other one, but it is in there. You've got video loss, tampering alarms, and so on as well. Uh, I'm going to jump past this one and come back to it. Basic admin and account settings, you can do system settings, you can also do a recovery configuration. So if you go out to Joe Blow's house and set it up, and Joe Blow calls you in six months time and says, I don't know, DVR is not working anymore. Take that USB stick, we've backed it up as Joe Blow's, you know, Joe Blow's DVR. Go back out to his house and say, what the hell have you done? Plug this in, fix it, hopefully out of there in five minutes. And that's mostly the time it takes to download the file onto there and set it all up again. So hopefully a really easy solution for people who tinker with things from time to time or try to break stuff like I do. Um, Hard drive settings are in here, you can format them if you've got multiple hard drives and so on. It's all the stuff that you'd expect to be in there. Uh, yep, external alarms as well. And here's your basic network settings again. I've done DHCP, I've got a default gateway in there, and I've got my ports at the bottom, remote port and HTTP port for multicasting. I haven't set up an IP address there or anything else for it, but it's the same kind of thing that you did in the other one. If you don't know how to do it, grab the RM access guys to do it, or your local computer tech. Um, having a local guy might be an important thing because you can call him up in an emergency or last minute or when you need him, and he's local enough to go around there and do it. Otherwise, the remote access guys do a fantastic job and well worth it. Um, jumping on, yes, you've got dynamic DNS settings in there. You can send out emails to it and 
if you're using a extra software, you can do all that through there as well. I know that was all a bit fast, but I wanted to get through it quickly so I can move on to the sexy IP DVRs. Does that all make sense? So yeah, HD, SDI, better quality if you've got the cables to do it, and a fairly economical way to get that extra quality. Most of the HD, SDI cameras are 200 to 300 dollars or so, I think, fully specced. Um, I'm going to show you this D1. Uh, sorry, this. Just with the yeah. Yep. With the 960 DVRs. Yes. I haven't checked one, them. One, I haven't checked them all out yet, so I don't know what each of them are going to be. But they're the same form factors as the old ones, so they should be able to handle one or two drives in the basic units. The 16 channel, I think, has got more space in it, but that I have to confirm. There'll be more specs on them as they come a bit closer. But yeah. Right. There we go. Yeah. Not really. <laughs> Um, actually, I was going to go to that one second, but uh, because this, this other one's a little bit less impressive, and if I was actually, there we go. What I've done here is I've got the NVR hooked up, uh, the NVR hooked into the router so that I can access it through the computer. You can actually access it locally. It's got a HDMI out and a USB for a keyboard and mouse as well. You can do all this same stuff just locally on the unit. But doing it on via a web page at the moment, and I'm going to go to this one. So this is Acti's D72 camera and the D72 is one of the entry level range. It's a 3 megapixel outdoor camera. It's vandal proof, it's fixed lens, fixed focus. It's a pretty simple camera and it's I think under $400 retail. Um, this is what when it updates. There we go. This is the image quality for it. So you can see there is a lot of detail in it. It is a good quality image. I actually prefer the HD SDI quality over this one, this particular camera anyway. Um, but this is an IP camera. Simple, fairly cheap, economical way to sort of get into this stuff. And choosing the right camera and the lens options and the rest will make a big difference in what it does and how it works. There are indoor, outdoor domes, there's bullet cameras, there's body cameras, there's box cameras, there's every kind of that you can imagine and every different format that you want to do with it. Obviously with the amount of detail that's in this, there's a lot of digital zoom and things that are possible for it as well. But this is a bit like the old analog fixed lens cameras, there's not a lot you can do with one of these. Set it, forget it, essentially. Um, the you actually see a lot of delay on that camera. Sorry? The updating was pretty slow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, at the moment I've got it backing up to the NAS drive. I've got the other one streaming through it as well. I've got my computer and all three of these all trying to pump data because I'm running, if I have a look in the background here, I'm actually running logins for all the other ones via the websites as well. So I'm. this is a domestic router. <coughs> it's not really designed for what I'm using it for, but this is what I had at home to play with. So uh, good commercial routers um, from... You know, big names and with big brains involved will have much less of that problem. Um, I'm also using MJPEG on that camera, so I'm getting those better still frame images out of it. H.264, less streaming, so it's going to be a less, uh, it's going to be a better picture quality overall. And the NVR is up to the decoding part of that job. But yeah, this I just wanted to do this quickly because this is the login for the new DVRs. This is the 960 line one. So, here we go. Slightly different layout from the previous ones, but my favourite part with all of these online things is the fact that you can actually configure them on here rather than having to plug directly in or get a screen directly connected to the DVR. If you put this thing in a roof or in your shed or in the garage, you don't want to have to go back to it every time with a mouse and a screen to be able to set things. All of our analog ones work this way, even the HD SDI is the same as this. You can click on the config and go in and you can change everything you can change on the camera itself through the website. So, very, very neat way to do it. And even if you haven't got all the remote access set up, it's easy to get these things working locally on a network, get this done. Yeah, much easier than doing it through the DVR itself. This is the old analog one. And 
I'm not showing you any of the Internet Explorer setup and the, um, the ActiveX controls and the rest because we sort of don't have time for it today. But go into the config here. And when it loads, there I've got all the details for this one as well. I can go in and set channel names by typing them in on the keyboard rather than trying to click them letter by letter by letter on the other thing, on the mouse. And all your recording settings and recording plans are in here, as obvious and as clear as they were on the other one. Um, I like doing the setups via the web page if you can. It makes it much, much easier. All right, so that's logging out, and I'm just going to get out of this one as well, try to reduce a bit of the network load and go back over to the IP ones. All right, so that was the D72, so that's the three megapixel. Now, as Graham's already pointed out, this is the, this is the Canon, the little one down in the corner, and what I've got it at is its highest zoom level. So I'm gonna zoom all the way out. Now, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll go back to that. Um, the idea is, you can see the resolution is pretty low. It's only about 350 TV lines on this camera. Yeah, it is low res, but it's a $1,500 camera because it's got, an, uh, I think it's a 96 times optical zoom built into it. It's full pan to tilt and zoom control via a single Cat5 cable or Cat6 cable. Can you wiggle the cable around in it? No. <laughs> that, that would be more fun. No. Um, this one has its own external power supply. It doesn't take PoE or power over Ethernet like some of the other ones do. Um, it is slightly older as a camera, but you do see quite a few of these in things like churches and funeral homes and so on, because if there's somebody in a booth with the controller in front of them, the computer in front of them, you can turn around and zoom in and out and so on. And at $1,500 plus the installation, plus the recorders and other stuff like that, it's probably a pretty cheap way of getting a camera into a into one of those environments without having to hire somebody to walk around with a camera and get in people's faces. You can sort of be apart from the action and still you know, take the videos that you might want for people that aren't there. Um, all of these cameras have got streaming engines and brains built into them so you can use one camera on its own without the DVRs and the rest to stream an image through a network and theoretically through the internet and to anybody else that wants to watch it as well. Just keep in mind that if you do that, the amount of upload that you're going to need to fire off multiple streams at once, uh, upload data is going to be huge, so don't underestimate it. Um, as I was playing with it before, yes, here it is, pan, tilt and zoom camera. It is uh, a little jerky on it. You can actually get into the settings and make it a bit better, but I haven't really played that much with it. Little frog eye thing keeps going around, and that's about as far back as it goes. You can see it is basically almost directly behind itself. Um, as I come around, I can also go down and go up, and it will fire its way right up the ceiling and not flip over, but uh, it has a little bit of fun. It's a neat little beast. Um, and you can see that this is it zoomed out at its furthest level. I'm not going to zoom in at the ceiling because that's boring, but let's go down again. Actually this way. It's upside down. There we go. So, I've got this here and I want to... Actually, I'm going to turn it slightly this way. There we go. And now I'm going to zoom in. So. We keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. Mm. And yeah, that lack of resolution doesn't make so much difference when you've got a, you know, a lens Long that can do this kind of thing. As we move around, get it back into focus. I mean, you can see the sharp edges of you know, what you're looking at. Um, over distance through a car park, if you've got somebody who's manually watching this thing, I mean, I'm reading the DOS logo off there. I can't read it with my glasses on from this distance. This, this is a good little optical sensor, there's a reason, a uh, good little camera. There's a reason why I think it's $1,500 US retail price for one of these. But, um, fun toy. Um, you can also have audio recording and playback if the camera is supported and all those sort of things just over the single Cat5 or Cat6 cable. Um, it's pretty surprising how well it just performed. Yeah. It was, it was actually pulling up the detail in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, if I was better at controlling it and had more time to play with it, I could probably do that quite easily and focus in on Louis's shirt and get the detail out of that and, you know, find out how many, you know, pimples I've got on my face or whatever it is, you know, just with, you know, just with that low resolution that it is. So remember last week I was talking about how high resolution means you can get more detail in image? Well, the lens, remember, that can make a big difference as well. 350 lines, it might be enough to pick up a license plate camera if you can zoom in from the right range to be able to do it. So, very, very neat. Um, okay, this is, so I've logged into the NVR here, so I'm going to show you a couple of other things it can do. It is just past 11, so if anybody needs to leave, they're more than welcome to. But I wanted to show off what it can do. This is a recording screen for it, and you can see there's a blue bar down the bottom for today. I can click back to there and see people wandering around earlier on this morning on this camera. Can you uh, actually, I honestly haven't played with it enough to know. Um, I don't think so. I don't think it's built in to do that. Okay. Uh, I think it's designed, because of the mounting brackets that are on it, to be mounted upside down, so it should always be hooked up that way. However, I could be completely wrong. It might be a feature. I just haven't seen it yet in any of the settings I was playing with. Um, obviously, that is on that camera. If I go up here and choose the acting camera instead, it switches over and I can look at the same sort of time periods, just click in here and choose what I want. And once it loads itself, I think I'm probably doing this too fast. There we go. Anyway, that should be playing back. I'm not quite sure why it's not. I've probably clicked the wrong thing and broken it somehow. Um, the idea is it should be fairly easy just to be able to pick up each of those recordings from, again, the screen at the bottom. You can, over here, you can download these as a video file directly to the computer that you've connected it to. Um, yeah. Lots of toys and lots of things you can do for it. Search in particular time periods and so on. There's a lot more in this than I've had time to even play with, so I'm not going to try and go through it all. But in here, we've got settings for each of these cameras. So this is the, D, the NVR telling the camera what to do. So I can tell it to uh, what its name is, where it is on the network. This particular NVR has got capability of taking up to eight cameras natively. I can go in here and set my recording settings. So I've set this one to Motion JPEG. Well, I'm going to set it back to H.264 now, why not? I'm going to set my quality level at 4.5 megabits per second. Frame rate, I want it 30. And apply. And bang, it's done. Just done the same sort of settings through a web, type, through a web page for the NVR for those cameras. And yes, works very, very easily. You've got your schedule settings the same as you do with any other one. You've got your start time, start finish, and durations. You can add extra sections on each day. So you can have those same multiple segments that you want to do. It does all the same things the analog ones do and more. Um, storage expansion. I deleted the NAS earlier, but I can add one pretty simply in here. If I know what the NAS IP address is, I dump this in here and then it knows to back up to that NAS drive. And I can go into the NAS, go into the surveillance station, then be able to pull up the footage from there. So when this thing runs out, it can dump its files over to there. It can back up live from here to this one. So if you're concerned about keeping your recordings for a long amount of time, easy way. Just get this thing to dump its files off over the network while you're not doing anything else. And yeah, very, very simple to work with. Um, yes, I think that's probably enough sort of waffling on about these. If you want to come up and have a play with them in a minute or two, you're more than welcome to. I'll leave them set up for a while here and yeah, we'll go through anything else that you need to know. So unless there's any other questions, I'll, I'll leave it there for today. All right, so I'm either going to put this at the start or the end of the last recording session for the DVRs. But I thought it'd be useful for the guys who weren't there to get a bit of an idea of what we were looking at and how the actual tech worked. Um, you didn't get a chance to pick over it hand by hand like the guys who were here did. So this is your quick little guide for that as well. So looking at the back of my array of cable untidiness that's here, um, let's start with the analog stuff. So we've got over here, uh, three different cameras. We've got an HD-SDI camera on the uh, that one in the middle of the frame. We've got an analog 
Dome 15 Pro and right up the front we've got a little Dome 30 Pro. When I was playing with the Dome 30 Pro settings on screen, that was that little controller there. It's a bit hard to see in the dark here, but whoa, hello, focus. It's focusing on the table. Let's try and zoom out a bit on that. So yeah, it's just a little joystick controller. You can press it in and you can control it up and down. It's pretty simple to work with. Um, the HD SDI camera, you can see it's got an SDI out. It's actually got an analog output as well. And there's a power cable in there too. Power cables, by the way, I've got a four-way splitter on the power cables running back and down to a well, one of those power supplies. Going back, these are the video formats and the video uh, cables. We've got RG59 running, that's their HD SDI lead again, so that's just a standard RG59 BNC lead running all the way and into the HD SDI input on the DVR at the back. You can see LAN and HDMI and all the other inputs and things you can play with there. I'm running VGA out because the projector only had VGA to play with. Uh, moving on, we've got the two analog DVRs above that. So the one with all the inputs is the 16 channel analog unit. That's our existing analog DVRs and the top one there is the brand new, well, test version of the 960 line DVRs. Again, we've just got an analog BNC feed in, analog BNC feed in for both of those. HDMI outs, although I'm using VGA, got network ports in them, alarm inputs and so on. And I'm using VGA from my laptop, obviously, to the switch to go up to the projector screen. Moving over, looking at Ethernet ports, takes me to the cable mess that is the IP and router side of things. I've got an NVR over here, a little QNAP or Viastor NVR. And on this side, we've got the QNAP NAS drive, little two bay NAS. Got Ethernet cables plugged into the bottom switch, which is a four by four, so four PoE and four uh, passive or non-powered, and one of those is running up into my TP-Link router at the top with the other three cables coming from the DVRs, the analog DVRs. The purple cable coming through here is on a PoE port, actually there you go, PoE port that side and running around to the Axis D72. On the other side you've got a separate power supply and a standard Ethernet jack out and back down to the switch, and that is the cables and mess at the back of things here. I've got multiple power boards, multiple power supplies, a mouse that I kept switching between each of the DVRs and my laptop so I could control everything. And so there you go. That's a look at the back end of the DVR training. I hope that you found that useful.